Formerly Spark Orange, you know, the news just came out a few weeks ago, um, which is why I still have the Spark Orange quarter zip because my Crow one is in the mail. Um, been at Salesforce MVP since uh, 2019 and uh, present a bunch of places, you know, very active in, in user groups, answer community, stuff like that. Um, just a little fun things about me down here in the bio. Probably the most important thing you can know about me is that I love period dramas and anything with you, Grant. Happy to answer questions about that along with enterprise territory management. Um, so yeah, that's what we're here to talk about today. Enterprise territory management. I feel like this is a really cool tool inside of Salesforce and I feel like it doesn't get enough airplay and not enough people use it. Um, so hopefully this will change that a little bit and start to you know, give people ideas of how to use it. Um, some basic use cases and then also some advanced use cases. And in order to make sure we all have the same level set, we'll go through ETM structure. Um, so if you're experienced with ETM, it would be a good review. If you're new to ETM, great, you'll learn a few things along the way. Um, after that, we're going to get into some advanced use cases for ETM. Uh, one, one thing that a lot of people are always looking to do is to automatically assign account owners based off of territories or regions. And so that's something that with a little bit of creativity and flow we can pull off. As long as with automating opportunity team assignments with enterprise territory management. Before we dig into that, I am going to steal basically all of Rakesh's uh, genius when it comes to flow design and uh, you know do a brief interlude on that as well. So let's get to it. Um, so ETM allows you to assign territories basically on a matrix format. So if you think about this, you know it's not just geography, it's not just product. You can use any combination of data points that are available on the account object in order to assign things to territories, and they can belong to multiple territories. And so if you're someone that has a territory pick list on your account or opportunity object that a the person has to like manually click and assign, and I know that there's many of you out there, this is a good tool that you may want to consider to automate some of that. Some of the things it allows you to do, um, besides just assigning those territories, this primary use case is opening up sharing access. So it's another way, another way to incorporate um, data sharing inside of your security model. There's some advanced use cases with list views and reports that are pretty cool that we'll talk about. The one that's really advantageous is if you need to segment your accounts into different categories or they have multiple territories like national named accounts along with regionally and locally owned territory accounts. It's very scalable. Um, it actually supports, I think, up to like 100,000 territories and we'll get into some of those limits. And they, uh, Territory assignments also run before flow in the order of execution. So as you're designing and coming up with solutions for this, it'll give you some, uh, give you an idea of where it fits in and how you can build around it. On the right here, you see, this is the general structure. You have types, you have your model, and then you have rules that apply within that model and those rules that apply to the territory. And then a few key objects to understand. You have object territory associations. This is just a junction that connects accounts to territories. And then the same thing for user territory assignments, connects users to territories. All right, good level set here, so we'll dig in. Uh, settings, so just like, an org, just like your org-wide defaults, you have basically territory management-wide defaults for settings. And this is a good baseline to establish, you know, for territory management, it, generic account contact opportunity case access that anyone in the territory could have. So you can see the different options here. Combination of view, view and edit, view, edit, transfer, delete, depends on what object it is. And then you even see down here as it relates to opportunity access. Similar to role hierarchies where you allow the parent to have certain uh, visibility of a child role, it's similar for territories. So you can grant that here. You see this little checkbox down here. It's an important one. Um, generally, we want assignment rules to always run when an account is inserted. However, if you are doing a data load with say 5,000 accounts, probably a good idea to turn it off just for performance reasons. Territory types, this they don't serve much of a function. Um, they can be, sometimes people are like, why do I have to define a type? We'll talk about how you can use them in a little bit. 
but they are required for every territory that you create. And so they don't have any direct function in automation necessarily. And you can determine what the priority means. So one could be the most important or 100 could be the most important. You can assign any number that you want inside of that priority ranking. And you can see down here with territory types a bit of how we can classify our territory. So if we have you know, a category or a region or a ter uh, an actual individual territory, um, we can use that to give some segmentation as we look at our territory model. And the reason why that's important, and you see a territory model here, here's an example, and this is the one we'll be using when we switch over to the org and start looking at some of the build and the demo. Uh, Automation Hour is a category. Ohana Slack members is a category. And you see where we have U US Northeast, US Southeast, both as regions, and then individual territories inside of those. So that's how those types can be used to help create a little bit of segmentation inside of your territory model. You'll see that you can uh, you can have up to two to four models depending on your version in an org, but only one can be active. You can run multiple branches like you see here. The limit is a thousand territories per model. Um, you can have up to uh, 900 or 99,999 if you have that many territories. I am scared to see the rest of your org. Um, there's a there is a soft limit that exists at ten at the uh, 10,000 mark and then you can ask for an increase up to 20k without anyone really asking any questions if you go beyond that they'll probably want to know why so the sort of uh the most functional unit inside of enterprise territory management is the territory itself and so as you look here you give it a label and from there you define territory level access so you have your org-wide defaults, as we said, of the, of the territory management, but then you have territory level settings that supersede those, those original settings from the uh, territory management screen. So you can be very specific in what the users assigned to this territory allowed to do. This is where you assign your users. Okay, and so you can do a couple of things here. You can obviously have active and active users. You can also assign them a role inside of the territory. And we'll see how that works with opportunity teams in just a bit. Another cool feature, you can manually assign accounts. So this works really well for say national accounts or things that aren't easily classified inside of a geography or a data point or legacy named accounts that some rep owned for the last 20 years. And even though their territory has changed, you still want them to own that account. It's where we would use this add accounts button and we would manually search for and select that account to assign it to a territory. Down here, and this is where we're heading next, rules. Rules are how we define everything inside of the territory management um, you know, system and allow those accounts to be brought in automatically. <laughs> this last point right here, rules are always and. and uh, I learned this lesson the hard way. I was building a very sort of complex territory management um, build for someone, and I decided I was going to use two rules. I was going to have one rule that, you know, sort of set one set of criteria, and another rule that I would always assign to all of the territories. Um, and I was hoping it was or, like either this one or that one. And after the end of like a week building it all out, couldn't get it to work no matter what I did and then someone uh, much smarter than I am on a blog somewhere said they're always and which means if you have more than two rules or more than one rule down here it's always an and statement that joins them together so just remember that one so rules themselves this should look familiar um, if you use like roll-up summaries or um, or you know make list views in classic it has that same sort of interface. You pick your field, you pick your operator, you put in your values. The nice thing about this is that you can still use like comma separated values to join together a whole bunch. You can use filter logic and different things like that. They can get pretty complicated. And so to follow uh, one of Recrush's primary rules of automation plan ahead, you'll wanna have this mapped out before you start building in here. And we'll show you a couple of examples of how complicated it can get. So the last uh, heading into some of the cool features that you'll see 
Um, on list views, it opens up some new views for you. So my territories accounts and my territory teams accounts and same on reports. It also allows you to group by territories. So this is a fun one because on the standard account and opportunity reports, it brings in the territory values automatically. In fact, if an account is a member of multiple territories and you group by territories, that account will show up in all of them. Uh, it's a pretty cool feature that I haven't seen um, in any other sort of report structure, especially on the standard account report, where typically you would expect the account to only be listed once. All right, so enough of the enough of the sort of talking about it. Let's get into the good stuff here. All right, switching over to the org. Um, so when you want to go to territories, you'll see the menu here. You have to turn it on. And this is where we have our default settings. And so we can go through, we can change these. So let's say we want everyone to be able to view and edit accounts. All of that's controlled here. You can turn them off if you need to. There is the option also with the assignment filter. Uh, I've known a few people to use this. And you can write an Apex class that will sort and assign the primary opportunity or primary territory to an opportunity um, if you'd like it to. But we're actually going to cover that use case and flow here in a little bit as well. Here are my category types or my territory types. And you see they're very simple. Um, there's not a ton of information here. And like I said, you can put in any numbers any labels, the meaning really is for you to determine and how you want to use it. So look at our territory model here. I call this one Salesforce Ohana. Uh, when you look at a territory model, you'll see when you go to the hierarchy, there's a couple of buttons up here. Uh, this first one, run assignment rules, will mass run all of the assignment rules that make up every one of these branches. You also have the ability to run rules individually. So, and we'll talk about the rules and the structure in just a second. And like I mentioned, only one territory model can be active at a time. And so that's where we have this archive button. So if you need to sort of set one aside as you develop a new model and bring it online, you can certainly do that. So digging into these individual territories. Let's take a look at the automation hour one. You'll see that I have a rule here called automation hour. And it's based off of the account automation hour equals true. Again, as you mentioned, you, all the fields that are available on the account, you can put here. It works with formulas. It works with roll-up summary fields. Uh, so if you want to you know, have different data points in here, summarize from other objects, you can certainly do that. I have it equals true. And here's an interesting checkbox. So we can reuse rules across multiple territories, but if we have a rule that applies from the parent on down, all we have to do is check this box. And when we go and we look at our hierarchy again, and we look at our children, you can see we have inherited rules. Then the territory has its own rules. Again, things must always be and. And so if automation hour equals true, and it's in one of these states, and I can take this away now, it'll be inside of our territory. So a couple of examples of really complex rules. Let me show you one here. I don't know how complex this may or may not be. All right, this one, pretty simple. Uh, billing state is Pennsylvania. Billing zip code starts with 1-5. Uh, so that's a nice way, especially when you get into territories where you're needing to split up a state, whether you use counties or zip codes or whether you have different data points on the account, you can use filter logic here. So in this case, Allegheny County, all zip codes start with 1-5. There is one little town or one town outside of Allegheny County that I want to lump in, so I can include that one as well. A more complicated one. Let's look at Memphis. Here's where we start to get a little bit more complicated. So for Memphis, I want those, there's a bunch of zip codes that start with 381. 
and then one digit after. So I want to include all of these. However, there's a few more where it's just like 38141 or 38152, where they're very explicitly stated, but not but not a bunch of sequential numbers. So I can't use a trick like this to say it starts with the first four numbers. And then down here, all but one of the 3810 um, zip codes fit, or all of the 3811 zip codes fit inside my territory. And so I want to exclude this one from this series, and I need to exclude 38121 from this series. So you can see I can write all of these rules, I can account for all the complexity of my zip codes, and then using filter logic down here, I'm able to uh, segment this out. I also mentioned that rules are and, and so I wanted to make sure I showed you guys a really bad example of what wouldn't work. And so here I have a rule for international and my rule for international basically says it's not equal to any of these US equivalent values and that it's not blank. But then I threw in another rule that says equals Canada. Um, so in this case, even if let's say we had one that was labeled Mexico, it would meet this rule but it wouldn't meet this one, in which case nothing would ever actually be assigned to my territory. And I can look and view that this doesn't work. And I can use the view accounts button and show me that there are no records available. However, if I remove this rule, and I were to look at a preview, okay, we're gonna have to run this guy real quick. you can see that now my United Oil and Gas in the UK has come in. So let me show you a few more things about how this works functionally as you're going through out throughout the org. One thing you'll notice is as we're going in and looking at an individual account, when you click edit, there's a new field here. And so one consideration when using enterprise territory management is that assignment rules are not triggerable via API. In fact, you are or not triggerable from Apex. You have to use uh, SOAP API. And so this box is here. So anytime you edit the record, you can check it and say reevaluate. Um, and I'll show you how this works here. My little tab, Terry and his friends. I call territories Terry just because uh, I feel like we're friends. We work together often enough. Um, and you can see I have automation hour, US Northeast, US, Pittsburgh Allegheny County. Here's a good example of it being able to be a member of multiple territories at the same time. And also you can see there's different levels involved, right? This is my territory, this is my this is my region, and this is my category. So if I were to edit this record, I'm gonna drop automation hour and just keep Slack. I'm gonna check this box. And I'm going to change this to Mexico. You'll see it reevaluated my territories, and now it's just in the international one. I also have a little uh, a little territory counter right here that I built, and we'll go into the flow and check these out in just a second. Um, but it works at the same time. So I'm going to flip this back. We're going to go automation now or do the opposite here. We're going to move this back into the US. And I'm going to make it right outside of my target zip codes here. I have 16066 in my Allegheny County one. I'm going to do 161067. And you'll see. I didn't check the box, did I? I didn't check the box. Ah, there we go. So now we're back in the US Northeast, rest of PA as opposed to Pittsburgh and Allegheny County. Count.
our territory count apparently is not behaving. Um, some other some other things looking at the the report that I was demonstrating earlier. You'll see this new field down here, territory information. And so we can add territory labels and we'll just switch this to all time real quick and all accounts. And we can see all of the territories that these are assigned to. And what I was mentioning is if we drag this label up here into a group and we run this, you'll see all the segmentation. So even though Express Logistics and Transport is in Pittsburgh, Allegheny County, it also appears up here in Automation Hour. So this is pretty cool when you think about the need and how you may need to report on different segments inside of your organization. So if you have to do a report on you know, dollars inside of a region or dollars inside of a, you know, originated from a particular type of business or product category of business, you can do all of that because an account can be a member of multiple territories at the same time. So we can filter in and say, we're only interested in those territories where the label is very specific. And so we only had the one that fit into this category. So using territory management and allowing it to live inside of multiple territories at the same time, based off the different account characteristics, will give you this flexibility, will allow you to sort of report on things, slice and dice, and roll things up into different categories with your reports. So those are the primary use cases. Uh, so what I'm gonna do now is I wanna transition into some of the more advanced ones, but before we do that, I gotta do a quick, very quick overview on flow design patterns. So I literally stole all of this from Rakesh. Uh, obviously, Automation Champion is a brilliant website. I was at Dreamforce and Rakesh was present, presenting on uh, flow design patterns. And then I think I, I messaged him like 13 times over the next 10 days asking him for his deck so that I can I could use it and learn from it. Um, and so the whole sort of basic concept around the flow design patterns that he was presenting and, and I've since adopted uh, comes down to this. We use one flow trigger per object per type per event. And I realize that's a lot of words, so I'll try and break it down a little bit. Um, so we have our object accounts and opportunities. And then there's really two types of triggers, before or after. And then you have the event. So triggers can be fired on create, on update, or delete. And so looking at this, you'll see we have account before create, account before update, account after create. And so in, in function, what you'll see is that in the naming convention that, that I've adopted is opportunity trigger after update, opportunity trigger after create. And then the functional piece of my flow, the part that actually does the thing that we, we need to get done, I'm calling those classes. And the reason why I've sort of adopted this language of triggering classes within Flow is it really brings the same design patterns that our developer friends are using with Apex into our declarative world of Flow. Um, furthermore, I mean, as, as the lines between admins and, and uh, declarative blur with the functions that have traditionally been programmatic, I think having a common language is a really valuable place to start. And so, um, that's where this naming convention comes from. But functionally what this looks like, it's just process builder. You know, especially for those who may not be fully using Flow yet. Think about what your process looks like inside of process builder. You configure some things in the start element and then you add a node that looks just like this. And inside of here, you add some criteria, which is all a decision element is, is criteria. And then you hit your action menu. So using, this design pattern, we have our criteria, and then we point to our actions, which are the subflows. And the subflows, which I'm calling classes in my in my naming convention, uh, are where all of the magic happens, right? This is where we're doing all of the work. 
so especially as we're transitioning into a world where workflow and process builder are no longer going to be you know fully supported in a few years um, now is really the time to start transitioning to flow if you're building anything new i would suggest starting in flow versus those other tools and having a consistent pattern in terms of one trigger per object per event per type and then using something like triggers and classes and, and subflows it's going to allow you to have a lot more structure and control over your automation but now back to what we're here for so the first thing and this is one that i think um, is a very common ask a very a big frustration you'll see people say oh man territory management so cool why can't i update the owners of accounts when i'm using territory management and a lot of this has to do with the, the flexibility of etm and that flexibility that allows a account to belong in multiple territories at the same time makes assigning owners complicated. And so what we've done and what I'm gonna demonstrate here is an approach that allows you to accomplish this. So beginning with here, we get our territory associations, you know, from that, from that trigger, we pass in our account ID and we say, hey, what territories is this account associated with? We do a quick count of those and we assign, and, and we assign those. And then we loop through our territories and we say, hey, are you, are you the one that's assigned to be an owner? And if it's not, we keep going back. And if it is, we go, great, gotcha. Afterwards, we do this quick decision and we say, did you find an owner? And uh, if we didn't, we go on and we update the count. If we did, we get that owner ID based off of our criteria, I'll show you that in a second, and we update the account. I mentioned this consideration here. Uh, you have to take, you have to design your territory model appropriately so that it's really only possible to have one owner. Um, so if you're going to have multiple types of territories, let's say you have a product-based territory, uh, you know, where if a company buys, you know, services, hard goods, and software from you, and you want them to be in each one of those territories, that's great. But you should still have basically an account owner territory that determines the assignments. And there should be no overlap inside of your account owner territory. Those should be mutually exclusive. Or in the case of if, if sometimes there's going to be a little bit of overlap, that's where you can use that priority level field on your type. So you can say type equals one, type equals two. And inside of this flow, you could target those where your priority level is one. So let's look at the flow itself. Switch back over. All right. We'll come into, we'll start with our update, with our uh, trigger here, and then we'll open this one as well. So again, you see our trigger, we're just asking a very simple question. Um, in this case, it's, it may not be that simple. Uh, we're checking to see if something was changed, if it was changed from populated to not populated. And we're also checking to see if our automation hour or Ohana Slack member fields were changed or not. If they weren't changed, then nothing fires and uh, it just keeps the, the, the trigger just stops. It doesn't call anything. If they were changed, then it heads over here into our territory subflow. Our territory subflow again looks like this. We take the account ID that we're passing in from our trigger. We're getting all of those records. We're doing a quick count and assigning that to a variable called Terry count. And then we get all looty with our collection. Ask a simple question. Hey, are you the owner? And what we're looking at is a field on our territory. So what's cool about our territory models What's cool about our territory models is you can add custom fields. So these four fields are my custom. So the first one I have update owner equals true, and then I have my owner email here. And so my flow, as it's looping around, it's checking to see is update owner true, and is there an owner email? And if it is, that's the one that we're grabbing and assigning to our variable. Now we're looking and we're saying, does our owner email actually have a value? 
If it does, we go and we find our user based off of the email. And then we use that to update our owner here. So going back to edge communications here, and let me draw another line. Right now, this is assigned to test user. I'm going to transfer it back to me. And let's see, what territory are you in? You're now you're in the rest of PA. Perfect. So my territory that I had set up here, again, test user, update owner, Pittsburgh Allegheny. And what we would hope to happen here is when I edit this and I move this just one number over into 16066, I'm going to check the box down here, hit save, magic happens. We're now back in Allegheny. And we should see our account owner here change. Hmm. That's curious. Apologies, because this was, uh, of course, the fun of live demo. This was working perfectly in uh, the demo org, or as I was testing this last night. Let's run it one more time. Ah, there we go. We're just waiting. Took a second to catch up. Um, so you can see now that our owner changed to test user from Thomas. And you can see our territory is updated as well. And our Terry count is three. Before there was two, so now there's three here. You can see that that was set as well. I'm switching back on screen two. All right. Our next use case, and I'll show you both of these at the same time. Uh, one, assigning the primary on opportunity. Remember. When we we're talking about the territory settings, this is where you could have um, assigned a Apex class to determine opportunity filtering and which territory gets assigned. We're actually doing that instead right here inside of our inside of our flow. Um, what I've done is I created a custom field called primary equals true. And so when our opportunity is created or updated, it's going and getting all the territory assignments associated with that parent account. And then it's looping through them. And it's asking, hey, are you are you a primary? And if it is, perfect, we caught them. And then we go down here, we make sure that we found one, and then we update the opportunity. And so the next one that we're gonna show as well is assigning opportunity teams. This one's particularly interesting for me because opportunity teams and default opportunity teams need to be assigned at the user level which is a horribly inefficient model, I think, because uh, you have to go into the user, you have to create their team, and then every time you have a user change or something changed, let's say you have one person leave and you have to go and now replace them through all of the user teams where there are, or you want to add someone, you have to go into the different users and make this update. And so using enterprise territory management, we simply add those users to the territory and we can assign them a role that matches the role of the opportunity team pick, um, pick list as well. And so what our flow does here, it goes in, gets the territories, it loops through them, and it checks to see if that territory is designated as one on our team assigned or not. And if it is, awesome. We go and we get the people, we add them to our collection, and then we just check, hey, do we actually get some people to loop? If we do, Great, we're gonna go through those. We're gonna to check to see if they exist as opportunity team members. If they do exist, we're gonna head back to our loop. If they don't exist though, we're going to add them to a record variable, add them to a collection, and then we're gonna create all of our opportunity team members in one shot. So again, the nice thing about this, it's based off of these territories. There's nothing to set, there's nothing that's user-based. And so as you need to manage this over time, as people come and go, or even if they become inactive, if someone becomes inactive, they're not in the territory anymore, no action happens. And so you, it makes it a little bit easier, and it gives you a single place to manage all of this instead of at a user by user level. 
So we'll dig into the build here. And coming back to our, take a look at our trigger. And you can see, first question I asked, we got some Terry's kicking around. And we're looking at the territory count on the account. So if Terry counts greater than zero, awesome. We're gonna head over here. The first thing we're gonna do is find and, and assign our primary opportunity. And then we're gonna get our opportunity team. Um, just so, I mean, the subflows are very simple. We're passing a single value. We're passing the record ID from our from our trigger in each one of these cases. And then we're doing all the work on our flows, on the actual flow classes. So we will start with assign primary up. Close these guys. Don't need you. And then we'll do get my people. So we get the opportunity and then we get our territory assignments based off of our opportunity account ID. Again, we do our loop and we're checking to see, it's, you gotta forgive my field names. I, I try to entertain myself as I'm building. Um, and so you'll see my field name, oh, oh, I'm a primary. That's the one that we're looking for. And if it's true, great. We're gonna head on over here to our assignment and we're gonna stash this territory ID here. Um, we checked to make sure that we did find the territory. So got them is null, false. And then we set that value on our opportunity. Perfect. And then our next one, we're gonna check, we're gonna get our get our territories or terries and based on the account ID again, same thing, we're gonna hit, we're gonna hit the loop. And then we're gonna ask, are we sending the team? And you can see I have another field here that says send team equals true. If I am, I'm getting those user territory associations. I'm adding them to a collection. I'm checking to see if my collection has people that I need to loop through. And if I do, my first thing as I go through this loop is to check to see if they already exist. So I say, okay, do you have an opportunity ID? All right, yep, do we have a user ID? Do you exist? Yes, no, we said, if it's yes, we don't need to create them as a team member, we head back here. If it's no, we head down this branch and we add them to our collection and we create our opportunity team members. And you'll see our variable here, we're adding a team role and we have our, um, adding them to our collection and then we create in this step. So we'll do this live here, live demo, what could possibly go wrong? You see we have our users here assigned, so we know who should be added. We're gonna create a new opportunity. I see my territory field here is blank. We'll hit save. You can see that Pittsburgh Allegheny was assigned as the territory. Um, when we look at the parent, I'd like to open you. When you look at the parent, there was three territories assigned. And you can see it picked our, the one that we wanted based off of, of our checkbox. This is primary. You could use this same flow and same trick using that type, using that type uh priority that we talked about so if you have a territory type assigned and you want the territory type to be um opportunity identification or you want to set your territory type to uh, account owner updates you could use that field and say check the territory type to see if this is what we wanted to do if yes we can have our flows proceed the other thing our opportunity team you can see both test user and Tom Hoffman were added as opportunity team members based off of the territory assignments that we had here. So again, another way to control opportunity teams without having to define it at an individual user level, it's scalable, it works. The flows are pretty simple and easy to build. Um, and it solves you know, a bunch of use cases. Again, account ownership, opportunity attribution within you know, multiple, a multi-territory model. 
And then you can also use it to control your opportunity teams without having to do so at an individual user level. So I'm going to stop talking there. Hopefully uh, this has been informative, give you some ideas of how to use enterprise territory management and hoping there's lots of questions to answer.